Okay, so hi everyone, good morning, first session of the day. I hope you guys are really awake and active, right? So, and I'm going to make this session quite interesting for you. Now, session, of course, as you know, since you're here, or if you're coming to the wrong room for information, is the session is titled, How to Become a Better Programmer. So if you're in the wrong room, you can only start finding the right rooms. If you're here, thank you for, for attending the session, for being a better programmer. Now, of course, why are we all here? Maybe we want to find, we are all programmers. Any of you here are not programmers, not coders? Super. In this session, there is nothing related to code or programming. <laughs> okay? But these are some simple tips that you can try to enhance your skills to get better at what you're doing. Okay, that's what I'm going to aim at. You're already wondering what do we have, what are we, why do we have this picture here, Mona Lisa? Anything connected to programming? Anyone finds a hash code or a cryptic code embedded in there? <laughs> right. Nothing like that. I'll come to why we are having this. Of course, we all want to know how to get better, how to get better at what you're doing, how to become a better programmer. Now, when you program, okay, what is a programmer? Who can define a programmer for me? Uh, again, just ground rules is that it's not going to be a theoretical session, a GAN session, one day session. I am going to ask you to give me the answers that's going to make up these slides. Uh, we'll wind up in uh, 30 minutes from now, approximately. I have uh, some content, but if we don't cover it, it's okay, let's cover the main points. Okay, because I wanted you guys to go to the next session, I want to cover it. So, what makes a programmer? What is a programmer? Who is a programmer? Somebody who converts requirements to bugs for a long term. Super much. I didn't pay him for this, by the way. <laughs> right? So, yeah, it's in simply you have some requirements. Convert that to bugs, eh? Okay? So, convert your requirements to your final product or your deliverable, right? This is what a programmer is. All of us do that. Now, there are a lot of steps in between. Now, there's a difference. People call themselves developers and then they don't do certain kinds of things. Okay, that's what we want to avoid it. As a programmer, you are responsible for the end to end situation, right? You guys need to, uh, uh, if you, let's say, get a requirement, you need to ensure that it's converted to the final product where your customer is happy. Okay, what does it take to get there? Okay, it's all in the mindset. It's all in your mindset. Whatever you do is in your mindset. Hope you don't have something as small as this, but it's all in the mindset. So, first thing is keep an open mindset. What does it mean? What's happening here? Who is this guy? What is he doing? Eh? Looks to be a photographer, right? I mean, looks to be doing something else, but I assume he's a photographer. Now, when you are a programmer, it's important that you care for your craft, care for what you're doing, okay? Be happy, be proud of what you're doing, and don't cause a nuisance to others. So if you're a photographer, maintain your sanity, you know, do what you're doing, ensure that you don't disturb your surroundings. So the main thing when you do is, you, that's, that's in your mindset, you have to care for your craft, okay? <coughs> Could have probably used the other <coughs> Okay, care care for your craft. If you are into the programming job as a as a you know just a means to get paid to buy nice gadgets, then it's just not going to work. You really need to enjoy what you're doing. That's the only way you'll become a better programmer, right? If not, you're a programmer. You're delivering what you want, but to become better, to take it to the next level, you need to involve yourself into it. Okay, so care for your craft. What's this? Who has heard of this? Can you tell me what this is about? What's antenna gate? Uh, what happened? Apple, I guess, four or four is this antenna not uh, functioning properly, and but they still overpowered, mm -hmm. and sales still jumped. Yeah, say it's Apple, so sales had to jump. <laughs> What did Steve Jobs make? What is the statement that he made ah, when the problem yeah. happened? So the problem itself, to set the context, was that the there was a problem with the antenna. So as simple as that. You pick up a phone, you hold the phone, it loses its signal, right? Now, who can make a call if your phone does not have a signal now? Okay. What does Steve Jobs say about that? You're holding it wrong. You're holding it wrong. So what was he doing? He's putting his problem on it. He was making an excuse, right? <laughs> what? Now, this was a, usually Apple guys, I mean, I'm an Android user, okay? So, Apple guys don't hate me. <laughs> 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 right? So, 
typically android guys we bash apple fanboys and so on but at this point of time even the apple users were irritated with this right of course no would you want to hold a phone like this and talk no right you hold a phone the way it's supposed to be held okay steve jobs started making excuses at this point of time later on he had to get back his the confidence of his users so he provided an option what was that bumper the bumper sets right the bumper case that he provided so when you are a programmer again re remember there will be a lot of requirements from your customers things would go wrong provide options and not lame excuses okay always provide an option what did he do he provided an option where he gave everybody a free bumper set <coughs> that's it he didn't even ask them to pay for it who are bought an iphone within this period got a bumper set Yeah, so what does the word mean? Antenna That's just to get you to understand what I'm talking about. Nothing on the slide has anything to do with what I'm talking about. I said, no, 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 none of the words on the slide have anything to do with what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> not nothing on the slide. <laughs> like right. Yeah, right? So again, I'm not going to relate anything to programming. We're going to look at real world examples to see what has happened, how the world uh, is behaving, and relate that to programming. Relate that to what you should do to become a better programmer. Okay, let me play you a short clip. If the clip even opens. Okay. Mm. wrong with this game. Hmm? Switch to Windows. Ah, I'm doing it. I'm switching here. Yeah? Okay, wait, let me. It's sticking to the PowerPoint. Ah, Okay. Yeah, I need to find my mouse for that. No, this. I'm getting a different screen here, though I've duplicated it. Yeah. Let me find my. Office, you have to work. You have to work. All of you have seen it. Okay. So while it's playing, what is what is this ad talking about? What did you understand from this ad? Role reversal. Good. How would you relate it to your job as a programmer? Everyone's frustrated. Right. I think all frustration as a program is coming out right here. <laughs> right? So, password protected phone, maybe. Right? Step, yeah. Step into your user's shoes. Let's say I'll not write these things, okay? So, step into your user's shoes. Whenever you have a requirement, don't try to understand it, think of it from your perspective. Get into your user's shoes. Find out what is their problem, what is it that they want. Okay? You can write a, a you know, 10,000 line code in, you know, in two days and give it to your customer and if it's not what he wants, then you're not a programmer. He's going to really bash you up. You're never going to get a contract again. Right? Think of what is it the user wants. Maybe it's just one single statement and one, you know, one a single line of code which will solve his problem. So step into your user shoes, understand what they want before you actually start doing your programming work. Okay? Think of that, step into your user shoes. Okay? Who's this guy? Right? What's he doing on a cycle? Is he a cyclist? Is he Lance Armstrong? No? He's actually studying the track. Yup, exactly. That's the little giveaway there, planning, right? <laughs> Plan your action before you actually do it. Okay? So even a guy like Schumacher, I mean, he's sort of my god, right? So in Formula One and car, so he's a Formula One is a ca ca racer driver for those who are not into Formula One. 
he's also the guy who got me out of formula 1 because he made it so damn boring by winning you know <laughs> race after race after race is like oh my god what's happening it's like i'm watching a replay right so he is a guy uh, you will not get onto the track and start racing you study the track though you have raced on it for many many years 11 years 10 years he's won five titles on each track almost though he studies the track every single race so before you do anything plan it plan your things now in planning what you do is you could make a lot of assumptions okay again we are talking about how to improve your skills as a programmer you might make a lot of assumptions test it always check your assumptions check if your assumptions are valid don't just rely on assumptions so test your estimates okay if you think that a piece of code is going to execute let's say in 10 seconds try it out write the code and see how long it's going to take don't assume things okay because the system would be different your uh, uh, run times would be different a lot of things would change right so always test your assumptions do this before you actually start developing okay let me what can't it seem to said yeah. you say come long but not coming off late yeah it takes some time to see the video as well, even though you see it okay even doesn't know who this guy is <laughs> धोनी <laughs> 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 He is the money by the way. Thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, same thing. I've got board of cricket as well. Thanks to IPL. But uh, he is Dhoni. He is. Uh, he is still the captain, right, of our team. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Don't boom me off the stage for that. Right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, he is Dhoni. He is a cricketer, and he is famous for this particular shot, helicopter shot. In fact, I think it's the only shot he plays. I really not seen him play anything else, and hitting runs for it. Right. <laughs> Now this says that it's sort of like practice, right? Practice. you pra he practices something he does something and then he's able to use it implement it really okay so the keyword that you should remember is prototype whenever you have a requirement whenever you need to do something for yourself or anything it would be don't just start implementing it don't get into the product of final code prototype it try it out write 10 lines of code don't go for object oriented write a procedural code write it as dirty as you can write select statements in your uh, view for all it takes right just see if it works and when you do prototyping you can also check it with your end users you can also show them is this what you're expecting before you spend 6 months on developing something and give it to them within 5 days you can show them is this what you're expecting okay so prototype important to do that prototype what are you doing prototyping and testing your estimations is part of planning you plan this before you actually start working on anything of course i'm not going to talk about any tips on development that's what we do that's what that's why we are programmers right so i'm not going to give you tips on development itself these are things surrounding that what you need to do next is course correction ensure you are on track you have done your planning you have done your things now ensure that you are on track to what you are doing you have heard of the broken window effect no okay nice uh it's a very famous theory i think it uh, came sometime i mean it originated in chicago chicago uh the law officers it's a very popular term in the us okay broken window effect what this means is let's say you have a house okay and somebody throws a stone and the window is broken and let's say your house is a little in a remote outside the city limits okay now what happens is some other uh, you know, crazy kids who want to cause nuisance walk by they see a broken window they say okay nobody's in the house let me break some more windows start throwing more stones at it then you have windows broken and then people say okay this four five windows broken nobody's repairing it maybe nobody lives in this house let me go do something there becomes a hotbed for drugs and things like that that's how it happened in chicago right that's what is a broken window effect how is this related to coding to program hmm if he is not following the standard why should i yeah okay that could be uh, relating to other people yes yes they are doing it yeah you, you know we procrastinate a lot right we tend to put off things so let's say we find a small issue is like it's still working forget it i'll let a bug come later then i'll fix it right now what happens is somewhere another bug is start getting into this because of this you are using this library some other uh, users get into a problem then their users get into a problem users i mean uh, users the code itself not the end users but the code so user library the used uh, piece of code gets a problem this is a broken window effect your code will start you know replicating 
I mean, your issue will start replicating, not your code. Your issues will start replicating. So if you find issues, take the time, fix it then and there. Don't wait for the broken window effect to happen. Don't wait for your code to get worse, right? Fix it then and there. It's again, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of mindset as well, right? You should get into this uh, feel good factor of your own code. Okay, so you need to fix it when it happens. Crash early. Okay, this is a car, this is a crash test, right? This is a car crashing. What would happen if they did not do this test and they gave you the cars and you actually got into accident situation? Yeah. You wouldn't be attending the session anyways after that happens, but you know, the, the thing is, crash early. Don't let a situation happen. If you detect that something is going wrong, crash your program. Make your program dump, okay? Put it down immediately. Let's say there is a wrong value that could enter the database. The moment you start detecting that some variable or some parameter is going wrong, already assert. Get out immediately, right? Crash right at that point. By this, you will know that something is going wrong. Don't think that, okay, I will handle this exception and I will change the value to this. If there's a divide by zero crash, same that you're giving me a wrong input. Something is wrong. Okay? Now, there are a lot of differences. There are a lot of subtle differences between using asserts, using exceptions, and so on. But the important thing is don't let your problem go down to the very end. The moment you detect an issue, crash it. Of course, assert. Assert is very important. That's something that we in our programming miss out a lot. What I've seen from my, uh, I've not given you a background, but anyway, I'll tell you that later. So from what many years of experience, uh, I'm not very old by the way, so in my years of experience, I've seen that uh, uh, we don't use asserts too much. We use exceptions a lot, okay? Asserts are really a superb tool. Just a uh, superb, you know, keyword, if you put it that way. So just assert. Which language can you, I'm not sure what asserts are. It comes in quite a few languages. I mean, I've used C++, Java, and I'm also proprietary languages. Asserts have come across in most of the languages. Well, what do you work with? Ruby, I'm a little bit new to that. Uh, scripting languages, probably not. Uh, you maybe switch it to an alert. I mean, if it's a UI language, you make it an alert. Just pop up an error immediately. Don't try to handle it. Different ways in which you could do it. The concept of an assert is simple. Don't send an issue, like let's say you're expecting some value, okay? Don't give a message back to the user saying that I was expecting this, did you do something wrong, please correct. They say you did wrong, get out. Program stops, dumps, terminates. That's it. That's what an assert is. Now, implemented in different ways in different languages, you could do it, right? Uh, you could just maybe exit the code with an error, exit the whole program with an error if there's no assert support in the uh, language that you're using. The concept is just stop, get out at that point if something is going wrong. But how is that better than handling the errors? Because at least you need huh. to know what's the root cause, right? If you give us to what is the. Uh, but see, the, the problem is we misuse handling errors a lot. We always try to say, okay, he's given an error. Maybe he meant to do this, so I will correct the parameter myself and I'll continue with my code. But that is why the handlers huh. are being made. I mean, why, yeah. why, why do we have exception handlers? Okay. So that we know where Yeah, going now, uh, I did not purposely put that little tip there. But I feel that tip is very important, where uh, we really need to know when to use exceptions. Okay, what is the meaning of an exception? What, what, English, what's exception? exception? Something that should not have happened. Yeah. Okay. Now, how do you know whether something did not, should not have happened or the user wanted to do something wrong? For example, let's say we are talking about a file, okay? Um, uh, okay, which OS do we take? Uh, okay, let's take Windows, for example, a standard NT OS kernel.exe file, right? It has to be there in the OS. Hmm? Now, if the file is not there, you're expecting, the OS code is expecting this file to be present for it to work itself. So these are the initial checks that happens. If the file is not present, should it start looking in, should it treat that as an error and start looking in other directories where it's present? Or it is an exception. Now, the code has to be there. This is an exception. It's an exceptional case where this piece of, this file is not present. So then it's an exception. It stops the code. Uh, again, it could, in fact, assert this point. Instead of throwing an exception, it actually asserts. But uh, Windows usually uses exceptions. We have the blue screen of death where you have your exception trace, right? That is an exceptional case. Whereas when you're looking for a music file in your player and you've moved your music file, what does it do? 
it gives you a pop-up saying locate your file now. If you use iTunes or uh, any of the Winamp in the past, right? It gives you a pop-up saying locate your file. That is an error situation. That is not an exceptional situation. Yeah, the user could have moved, so what's exceptional about it? Right? It's not nothing great. So just find out. Tell me where the right path is. Okay. So we should differentiate between exceptions and errors. Uh, I have seen that uh, popularly we use exceptions everywhere. Okay, we never use errors. We use exceptions everywhere. But exceptions has to be used for exceptional situations. So if you have, let's say, about 100 error codes, 100 places where you can go into an error, maybe 10 of that are exceptions, not all. Okay, just a rule of thumb. Assets are something that is a little more stricter than exceptions. Okay, where an exception still lets you handle it, and assert, assert will not let you handle it also. It just says, stop it. Get out. Okay? If that is the case, then user will not have any idea, right? Why it is turned Let us say, I'll give you an example. Give the right stack, stack trace. Let us say, username <coughs> and password should be mentioned, hmm. and username should not be a mail ID, let us say. If mm -hmm. you consider a barcamp application, their username ha. should be a username. Suppose if I enter the mail ID, hmm. and enter the password, and log in. I hmm. don't know, like usually, hmm. username will be along with full thing. Mm -hmm. Then if the application suddenly terminate, then what right. user thinks, okay, something problem may be with right. the application, and right. it's redirect, instead of redirect thing. What do you expect the user? What What do you want the so behavior to happen? you can give the order. Username should be only ha. the username, not a mail ID, right. or something. That is a wrong. simple error. So you don't put assets there. In the ah, use case of that, so you don't put assets. That. Then right. also, mm -hmm. as you said, execution is required there, even mm -hmm. though it is a come to as assets, as you said. Mm -hmm. So that kind mm -hmm. of execution, again, okay. uh, uh, I'd like to add a correction here. In the case of context of web applications, mm -hmm. it would be more appropriate to say terminate the session rather than the application. Of course. Yeah. But, uh, in, in the user. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there is no concept of terminating the application. It does not make sense in the case uh, of a. The web uh, server should not go down just because one user did something wrong. Right? Yeah. It, you have to be judicious about it. Now, where assets really help is in the testing part, okay? Because the moment something goes wrong, it's a it's a dump, okay? Now, uh, whenever we have testing, we have different priorities, right? Minor, major, critical, severe, and so on. When is something critical or severe? When your application crashes, right? As a developer, make your application crash. Make ensure that you do, you are completely bug free. So make your application crash whenever there is something going wrong. So use an asset so that your application crashes and your testers, if there are any, report that there's an error. Or you yourself, if you're testing, you know there's an error. Assertions are mostly when you want to actually test your assumptions, right? And you want to ensure that it doesn't yep. actually fail. Of course, of course. So you're, exactly. So you're assuming that something is, has to be there this way. Some variable has to have this value number so equal not to 5. actually letting the system go into an error. Exactly, exactly. That's the point. So you don't let it, see, the moment you get into an exception, you have a little more freedom where you start handling it. In an assert, you say, this has to be this value. And you don't I, I don't want to do anything more, so you assert there. You just stop there. Okay? Use asserts. Use asserts wherever you can. Again, wherever you can, don't use it just for the heck of it. Okay? <laughs> yeah, then... Uh, yeah, the uh, paradigm of programming with the asserts. Mm -hmm. Assertion as such. It's actually a style of programming. Yes, programming. yes. In fact, uh, <laughs> in my language, we do... Uh, I program this language called ABAP, which is... ABAP? This company's language, <laughs> right? So, uh, very weird thing. Whenever we expect, there's a piece of code where I don't know why we do that, but there's a piece of code where we don't want it to come to that at all. We say assert one equals two. There's no way of escaping it. But f for example, let's say you've deprecated a method. Okay, there's no real deprecation like Java making it obsolete deprecated. Now, when we deprecate a method, we send notice to others, let them change it, give them one year time to change, one year time to change. And if they still don't do, if, okay, after one year, I put an assert one equals two. Now, if somebody else is still using after all these warnings and time, tata bye bye, thank you very much. Right? Your program is going to fail. That's where you use assets. We don't throw an exception saying that because now he has to start handling that exception. Yeah, if I throw an exception out. Handle the exception, yeah. do something around it. Yeah, exactly. They say, okay, handle it, but you're giving me the output, it's okay, leave it there. Right? No, thank you. It can't be handled. Huh? It can't be handled. Just fails. Okay? So, cases. There are cases where you do it. Not all cases, not everywhere. Okay? Again, this is something that I have told a lot of developers that I've worked with. Uh, I hope anybody here are testers, quality testers. I do testing. Huh? I do testing. You're testing, okay. You do testing, good, but okay. Don't get me wrong, but what I tell my developers is put the testers out of a job. Okay? Ensure your code is that great. Because I don't know, it's very irritating. Developers say, why should I care about this bug? The testers will find it anywhere. No. <laughs> what the hell, man? I mean, uh, seriously, I, yeah, I find that very, very irritating. I'll tell them, put, you ensure that you put them out of a job. That's your KPI. 
unfortunately, testers also come back to us saying that uh, my KPS will raise 10 bugs in a, in a month. So your code does not have bugs. What do I do? <laughs> Sorry, man. I mean, what do I do about that? Right? So testing is a very integral part of development. That's where we have this. A programmer's job is to translate requirements to the product. And testing is a big part of that. Okay? During development, after development, just before it goes to the customer. Testing is a very integral part. Some tips on testing. Okay? I'm not going to talk about testing here. Use a saboteur. Test your tests. Okay? You have written a test. Now, how do you know your test is working? Branch your code. Introduce a bug in your code. You yourself make a coding mistake in your code. Okay? Put a wrong variable. And ensure that your test fails. Test that your test is failing. That it is catching this error. Okay? Sabotage your own code. Tough, nobody would have done that. But that's... Alternate in your test only, right? Giving a wrong output, you would expect... Yeah. Try for all yeah. the... So your test should actually give you a notification if something failed. <laughs> Right? Rather write the test for the wrong output and... Mm -hmm. Let your test turn red. So if you're using unit tests, normally unit tests will be green. Okay? Branch your code out, depending on whatever language you're working on, how you do it, so that you have a bug and now your tests turn red. Reverse psychology. Ah, reverse psychology. So test that your tests are still working. Maybe the test has become obsolete. Some tests are obsolete that is not doing any testing in itself. Right? So test your tests. Very important. Very tricky. It's fun to do, by the way. Right? Maybe what you can do is, if you're doing pair programming, you break his code, let him put bugs in your code. It's, it's really fun. I mean, it's good to do that. Try that out. Okay? Test your tests. Testers can also do that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Uh, what's this? A lot of colors, yeah. Colors, dials. I need to find out which car this is. It looks awesome. I would like this car, though. Oh, my God. You would be not looking at the road if you have this as the console. <laughs> Actually, it's a McLaren F1. No, it's a no? BMW M3. Uh, BMW? BMW M3. But the BMW should have the logo here. That, that is BMW. That's a, yeah, that's an M3, exactly. That's an M3, but... Hmm. It's an M3? Because that's... Any M. M series, yeah. What is the McLaren's logo? Okay, anyway, let's not get into that. But uh, what is this? This is essentially... Okay, the point that I want to bring about is you ensure that you have a lot of tests. Okay? Don't just write one or two tests. Ensure that you have a lot of tests. Tests very often, automated <laughs> tests. The test should execute automatically every time, and the test should execute a lot. Can I ask something? How many of you actually use test-driven development? I know how awesome it is, but then uh, you know hmm. I'd probably get fired if we yeah. use it. We don't hey, have so much time to. You yeah. know. I do it in all my hobby coding. Whenever at home I'm coding, I use test-driven development. In office I don't have time to do it, but <laughs> at home, whatever hobby project I do, I use it. It's super. I mean, so anybody uses test driven development, development religiously? Okay. We need some barcamp sessions on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, seriously, test driven development is superb. I mean, I, uh, in my company, which is this company, okay. in this company, I'm a coach. I'm sort of called an agile coach here. So, where I encourage my team and everybody else to use test driven development and other methods. Okay, and I have from that I do it in my hobby projects. So nobody told me to do that, but I still do it in my hobby projects. I find that it reduces my development time by about fifty percent. I code really fast. I can code really focused if I do test-driven development. Okay, so since no, not many of you have worked with it, look it up. Look about test-driven development. Look at how you can use unit tests. Unit test. A very important to remember. Unit test is not a way of testing. Okay, please remember that. Unit test is not a means to do tests. Unit test is a means to do development. Think of it that way. Change your mindset. So there's an initial barrier to actually get, you know, get it set up yep. for your application. But exactly. Once you get that, you you feel good about yourself. It's superb. I mean, so you that, feel really comfortable. That's where everybody feels. Yeah. They don't tend to, you know, set exactly. it up initially and work on it. But once you do it, you will, hmm. you know, fret if you don't write it. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And you really, you break up your code, your requirement into small atomic chunks when you do unit testing. Right. Uh, we, uh, there's a, some rule that we make some of them follow where. If you are writing a piece of code for more than 15 minutes, it's not modularized enough. If you are finish writing a piece of code, you need to finish it in 15 minutes. It should have a, the output given back to you. If you're writing the code for 30 minutes, break it up into two pieces and test those two pieces. So what should happen first? What should happen next? And finally, what is output? Three tests, write your code. Okay. So thing is, tests, I'll test a lot. Now, what this is, this is an information cluster. These are all your diagnostics. There'll be a diagnostic somewhere engine. Oil failure, probably. No, where is it? Right. A lot of diagnostics will be there in your car. What this is doing is every time you switch on your car, 
it will do these tests, right? You don't need to do it yourself. You don't need to start your car and push the test button and say, okay, if everything is working. Test should be automatic. The test should run automatically. Test should run, give you an error the moment something, oh yeah, the oil is here, by the way. The oil is here, battery indicator is here. Uh, somewhere there should be an overheating if there's no meter, right? So do, let your tests run automatically. Okay, yeah, uh, just rushing through others quickly. Uh, you have done all this, okay? Now, how do you improvise? How do you now take all these things to the next level, right? You have now taken yourself to the next level to, you know, becoming a better programmer. Now, how do you take becoming a better programmer itself to the next level, okay? You need to improvise. What are these? Hmm? Yeah, that's not a cupcake, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are the molds in which you make the cups, right? Now, uh, yeah. I have a few. Okay. Imagine you have to, you know, make dough or bake dough and cut the cake out of it every time. Right? How many of you cook? How many of you eat? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So you have fancy looking cakes and things like that. Right? It's not possible to cut out your cake every single time that you want to make it, right? So these are molds where you just put in your dough and the cake comes out in the correct shape. What is this translating the code? Write code. Try to write code that generates code. Meta, okay. Metaprogramming. Huh? metaprogramming, yeah, you can do that. Uh, use also tools that help you generate code. Okay, for example, uh, simple case, I mean, Eclipse, right? Eclipse is a really superb tool, which comes to the next point. Uh, you write your variables, it creates all the, uh, what do you call, method, get a set of methods for you, creates a frame for you, right? So use, don't write unnecessary code. Yeah, I know, uh, you know. In the past, we have been this notepad freaks where we write in the notepad, I mean, really uh, olden days, where we say that, no, I don't want to use an editor, right? Why? Uh, I want to be a hardcore programmer. I'm a hardcore programmer because I type every single letter, right? Yeah, what is it going to serve you? How long are you going to write a public static void main for, you know, 50 years? Uh, pointless, right? Just PSVM, get it done, let Eclipse expand it for you. Sorry? Boilerplate, exactly, boilerplate coding. So write things, if you do, if you have it, use it. If not, write code that generates code for you. Okay, don't unnecessarily keep writing code. Of course, you should know what it's doing. <coughs> right, don't use uh, generated code just for the heck of it. You should know what it's doing, but write code that generates code. Very uh, useful tip, which in my life, uh, I have worked on problem, multiple languages. I have been this notepadder guy for C++ and Java many years back. I worked with Visual Studio, C++, .NET. I worked with Java where I use Eclipse, NetBeans, and maybe on Linux for Python programming, Vim, VI Vim, right? So, uh, I mean, madness, a lot of tools. What is, okay, now, everything has a different set of keyboard shortcuts, a different way of doing things, and so on, right? <laughs> Why show off to the world that, yes, I know this, I know this, I know this, I know this, what is it going to achieve you? What is the output? Is the customer going to ask you, did you use Eclipse for this? Right? Is an end user going to ask you, is a manager going to ask you, did you use NetBeans for this? Pointless. Learn one editor and learn it really, really, really well. Okay? Forget about all the gimmicks about 100 editors. Just learn one editor. In fact, Eclipse, I think it also has no support for Visual Studio. You can even write uh, .NET and C Sharp on Eclipse. Right? It has a CDT development tools. I mean, I even saw the plugin. I've not used it for now, but I know it has a plugin. <coughs> so I am switching over to Eclipse. I'm not a big Eclipse fan, uh, but I'm switching over to Eclipse. On the Linux side, I use Vim for everything. Vim, Vim has a lot of plugins to do everything, right? So use one editor, your favorite editor. It can even be Notepad for all you know, right? You don't need to learn anything after that. But use one editor and learn it well because a lot of time that you spend is in the unnecessary stuff. For example, if you use a Notepad, you need to use, uh, you know, it's in fact, uh, it's actually interesting when Apple and Microsoft were having this discussion when Windows was starting. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. On time? Yeah. Uh, five more minutes I have, right? Okay, I'll be done with that. Right? Uh, when they started, uh, or in that community at that time, there was a lot of discussion that using the mouse wastes a lot of time. But I think Apple was more towards mouse because they didn't want to use the keyboard and all those kind of things. Right? In Linux, if you use Linux a lot, you use a lot of keyboard shortcuts. Now, imagine every time you want to, you're typing something, you want to go pick up your mouse, you waste, I don't know, that's a point two of a second, right? Uh, ten, five times you do that, you wasted one second. So you waste a lot of time just doing unnecessary things, moving your hand to the mouse, picking up the mouse, doing things. Your hands are on the keyboard when you're coding, let the hands stay there. Keyboard shortcuts. Whichever language, be it Eclipse, be it Vim, use keyboard shortcuts. Use your editor's power. 
that saves a lot of time. You can get a lot of things done with that. Okay. So I feel this is a very useful tip. In fact, the best of the lot, I would say, learn one editor, stick to that. Okay. Just learn it really well. Uh, okay. I'll not go to that. So let's wind up, give you time to move to the next sessions. There's this one last uh, tip. Okay. Any of you have seen this painting? It's a painting, of course. We, I showed you Mona Lisa in the beginning, right? For those who came in late, I showed a picture of Mona Lisa at the start. What did it have to do with all this? This is also a painting. <coughs> the painting is titled Water Lilies. Huh? Uh, not very famous. Have you uh, heard of, okay. Have you heard of a painter called, it's written Claude Monet. It's, he's a French painter, right? Claude Monet, that's how he is. He has made 250 of these paintings. Probably the lily is here in this and the other painting lily is here. 250 of those. Huge uh, scape of it. He's basically painted the lilies in his backyard. He's a world famous painter. Probably those paintings are known because he spent so much time creating 250 similar kind of paintings. Okay? Anyway, irrespective of the fact. What do artists do when they finish painting? Right? Sign your code, not visible on the projector, but you will see his signature here. Right? All artists usually sign it. Be proud of your code. Be willing to sign your code and certify your own code. That's what makes a great programmer. That's what makes a really good programmer, right? When you write a piece of code, you should stamp it. You should say, this is code, this will work. Use this code. So be proud of your code. Sign your work. Legalities aside, there are cases where you cannot do it. Maybe sign it as a team, right? But you should be proud of your own code. If somebody asks you, you should say, yes, this is my code. What do you want to know about it? Okay? I'll end with that. Thank you very much. Been a great audience.